From moonstruck lunatics to the idea that it's made of cheese, the moon has inspired more myth than fact. So much so that Earthlings eventually sent explorers 384,402 kilometers away to find out if there really was a man in the moon. Sadly, they found no evidence of lunarians or cheese. All they found was a big lump of boring rock. As we stare up at the moon and contemplate the comforting rhythm of its monthly phases, you might wonder, what does the moon actually do? Does it really need to be there? And what would happen if we were to smash it to pieces? Our planet didn't always have a moon. The prevailing theory of the moon's formation suggests that about four and a half billion years ago, a Mars-sized rock called Theia slammed into Earth, vaporizing much if not all of it, and flinging out chunks of rock that eventually coalesced into the moon. Destroying the moon could just be seen as revenge for the chaos that Theia wrought on our world all those years ago. But there's actually a really good reason to get rid of it. Astronomers' observations of distant objects are often impossible because the moon outshines them by so much. It's 14,000 times brighter than Venus, which is the next brightest object in the night sky. Without a moon, we'd be able to see much dimmer and more distant objects in space all year round without having to wait for the right phase. Another bonus is, if we did destroy the moon, it could result in Earth having rings. Some astronomers think that Saturn got its rings when a relatively small moon got smashed up, or maybe a larger moon had its outer layers stripped away as it fell into the young planet. If our entire moon got turned into rings, they would be far larger and more impressive even than Saturn's. Although some huge chunks may fall to Earth and kill people. So before you fire up your laser cannons, let's have a look at some of the benefits our shiny sidekick brings. As Earth spins, it wobbles slightly on its axis. On some worlds orbiting other stars, this causes extreme seasonal changes. The gravitational pull of our moon moderates Earth's wobble, keeping the climate stable, which is a boon for life. Without it, we might have enormous climate mood swings, with different areas getting extraordinarily hot and then plunging into long ice ages. We might even have the moon to thank for life getting started on Earth. As the moon orbits, its gravity tugs on the side of Earth that's closest to it more than the side that's further away, causing the sea to slosh back and forth. We call this sloshing the tides. Today, the tides are good for surfers and sea creatures, but in the past, they might just have provided the spark needed to turn the primordial soup, a collection of simple precursor chemicals, into complex life. Four billion years ago, when life first started on Earth, the moon was probably about half as far from Earth as it is now, resulting in much bigger tides that ebbed and flowed every few hours. According to Richard Lath's theory, these tides created the conditions under which double-stranded DNA molecules replicated with each tidal cycle. This may have created the molecular foundations for the first life forms to emerge. This is a fairly speculative theory though, and it's just one of a number that have been proposed for the origins of life. Are you a complex life form wanting to know your panspermia from your primordial soup? Check out our video all about the origins of life. And if you want to hear about all the latest scientific discoveries, subscribe to our channel. All life forms can get 20% off a subscription to New Scientist using this link. In the late Silurian and early Devonian periods, some parts of the world saw tides four meters high. When the tide receded, some fish would have been trapped in small pools, and it's thought that this intertidal environment might have spurred the evolution of lungs and legs for walking on land. It's here you'll find intertidal spiders, like this one named after Bob Marley, or sea stars that like nothing more than prying open a mussel, ejecting their own stomach into it, and feasting on the digested mess. They might be bizarre, but these creatures really do appreciate our moon. 400 million years or so later, some descendants of those first fish to foray onto land evolved brains large enough to wonder whether the moon served any real function. Apollo 11 and five subsequent lunar lander missions saw 12 people explore the moon's surface to uncover more of its secrets. Apart from being a phenomenal technical achievement and a massive propaganda win, those missions greatly advanced scientific knowledge. It turns out getting rid of the moon would mean getting rid of the best place to learn about Earth's own past. Today, the moon might seem a bit of a dull, uneventful place, but it wasn't always like that. When it first formed, the moon was volcanically active, with a core, mantle, and crust just like Earth, and it was just as susceptible to a meteorite strike, or 10,000. Whatever was going on on the moon was also going on on Earth. Since then, Earth's tectonics and erosion have erased much of its geological history, smoothing out billions of years of violent activity. That means the moon is the best geological record we have. The Apollo missions brought back samples with tantalizing hints of water. And in 2008, India's Chandrayaan-1 mission detected evidence for chemical bonds between hydrogen and oxygen. 
More probes followed, and in 2020, NASA announced that it had found water on the sunlit surface of the Moon, showing that it wasn't just found in cold, shadowy places. This lunar water may be key to an exciting future for the Moon. NASA is already planning to send humans back there in 2024, including the first female astronaut to set foot on the Moon. Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are planning to send spaceships there too, and China, Russia, the US and Europe are all working on plans for Moon bases. Aside from new scientific discoveries, onward travel from the Moon is a distinct possibility. The energy required to send objects into space from the Moon is much lower than it is from Earth. If we're ever going to send humans to Mars or beyond, the Moon seems like a good place to start. So there are pluses and minuses to smashing up the Moon. Keep it for the tides, our mild seasons and a site for space bases, or blow it up as a boon to astronomy, revenge for Theia, and to decorate Earth with rings. Let us know what you decide. I know which i choose. What does the moon actually do? Does it really need to be there? What would be happening? What would it be? <laughs>